Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are doing another, um, I suppose, a, a practice focus. I think we're, we're speaking to a number of practitioners who use the FIT test. And um, with the recent introduction of Zonulin to our panel of tests, which is now included in every FIT 132 and 176, um, it was, I thought it'd be a good idea to talk about inflammatory bowel disease. And who better to talk about inflammatory bowels than the magnificent Karen Ward. Um, so we're going to be talking to Karen for well, about half an hour or so, and then we're going to leave loads of time for questions. Um, there is a chat box, there's a, a Q&A box, so pop your questions in there if you think of anything. Um, we'll try and cover those as we go through. And if there's anything we don't get to, um, I'm sure Karen would happily reply, or I will. And if it's logistical stuff like how to test, when to test, what to test, um, send those over to me and I can um, get back in touch with you after the session. Um, I'm sure most of you do know who I am. I'm Charlotte Hunter. I, um, I, I, I can never, I'm not quite sure what my job title is with KBMO, but I do everything related to KBMO in the UK, um, but it is a US company. Um, so if you aren't ordering it from us now, you can email me and I'll set you up with everything that you need um, in order to create an account. Um, and I think we'll just get started, Karen. So do you, I'm just going to let you introduce yourself because I'm sure you'll do a much better job than, than I can. <laughs> I don't know. We'll give it a go. <laughs> it's better to see people saying, who are you and what do you do? And you're like, eh. <laughs> So yes, my name is Karen Ward. I am a nutritional therapist and I have been in practice for nine years now. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I lecture for the, one of the UK colleges of nutrition. I run a private practice since the very beginning. Um, and I started doing a lot more online work recently due to the situations we find ourselves in. Um, my journey into this nutritional gig that I find myself in daily now was never planned. It was not part of my life plan at all. And a lot of people who do know me have actually gotten to know me from my story because I way, way back, not too long after leaving college, I was um, approached by that you probably know the magazine what doctors don't tell you with Brian Hubbard in the UK and they were like we heard all about your story we'd love to interview you and they did this massive like four or five page spread and it went to America and it was all around Europe and it was that was kind of I find people went oh you're that girl who had Crohn's so I've kind of become known as the girl who had Crohn's um but it's a good news story because um, I've come from a very dark place and I'll tell you a little bit about that when we get stuck in but the good news is that there's so much we can do so I've kind of ended up here by um, life events but I'm very glad I did um, I realized I really like what I do I was an engineer before this so it was um, a big shift and a big change but the, um, the journey to how I got here I see unfolding in front of me with the clients I meet every single day. So it's kind of, I don't know, would you call it healing or painful? I don't know, Charlotte. <laughs> so, you know, it's a bit like, oh, this is a bit too close. But but that being said, um, yeah, I find myself here for a reason, I suppose. And um, I love teaching and I love talking. So let's see if we can do the half hour. I've been known to go on a bit. So you're going to have to, <laughs> you know, you're going to have to, you know, cut me off because I have a tendency to tell, tell a yarn, you know, so. Yeah. Um, well, so yeah, that's I my, that's, that's my very, that's my very uneloquent um, introduction to who I am. Well, just, just, just to give us all a bit of context, I guess, whereabouts are you based um, and what kind Ooh. of people do you work with? Obviously, yes. obviously IBD, but um, just generally a bit about your practice. Yeah, so I practice in Ireland, um, in the south of Ireland, in a really lovely place called Kinsale. It's right by the sea. I would see people predominantly with like autoimmunity, um, particularly with a focus on inflammatory bowel disease, again, because of that connection I have personally. But I find as, um, as the years have gone on, I would start to see a lot more people with ankylosing spondylitis, psoriasis, uveitis all the itises and um i uh, sorry ibs of course is like a hallmark of you know pretty much every second person i meet so it's predominantly the, the inflammatory conditions autoimmunity um ibd and um just general complicated clients 
I don't see anybody straightforward anymore, um, which is good when you like problem solving. Um, yeah. But it's quite, I found that that's where I have kind of, you know, by through no drive or plan, I suppose, Charlotte. Mm. So, so it's predominantly like I have a very strong, obviously, like local client base. People prior to lockdown, people were traveling like really long distance to come see me. Starting to work in Zoom has made it a little bit more easy for that. Because um, mm-hmm. obviously with bow, a bowel condition, getting in a car and the prospect of driving for four hours is not something that one can take lightly. Mm-hmm. The Zoom has opened up a whole new set, um, you know, I suppose, a set of possibilities for people. Um, I have a lot of clients in Europe, in the UK, and a few in America. So, but predominantly I'm here. I'm like, predominantly I'm local. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. I like that. You're the, the itis nutritionist. It's pretty much become that way for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think it is interesting, isn't it? Because we, we've both been in practice quite a long time. And when we started, it really was blood sugar and constipation. You know, and oh. I think things have moved on so much more from um, yeah. right at the beginning. Yeah. So, and I see, do you, do you ever feel like Charlotte as well? I often feel like one day, I think I remember seeing something going, if you just want to, you know, lose weight, don't come to me. Like, as in, I want really interesting cases. I don't think yeah. this is as interesting, but I feel like that fatal word you may have also uttered, I don't know, yeah. um, has become a reality, but you know, it's not a bad thing. It's yeah, bad. it's a good thing. Em- em- embrace the madness. Exactly. But I just, <laughs> Um, the ISIS girls, yeah. So um, we'll come back to a bit more about your practice, but I think well, what everyone's dying to hear, I, I know your story quite well, um, but going back to your little what doctors don't tell you teaser, um, <laughs> do you tell us really about your story and um, your experience and I hate to use the word journey of um, um, inflammatory bowel disease? Yeah, no problem. Yeah. So I often say my story began at around three weeks of age, but it was, um, I'll bring you very quickly for, through the, for, the formative years, but I was, I was quite sickly when I was born and I had my first antibiotic at three weeks of age and continued to do so for most of my young child's life. I was always picking up everything. I had asthma, I had allergies, I was allergic to animals and you know me, Charlotte, I adore animals, but I couldn't be around them and it was absolutely heartbreaking. I had chronic sinusitis. I was always complaining of pain in my tummy and all through life. And you know, a typical Irish girl was like bread and potatoes and pints of milk. And not that there's anything directly wrong with those foods, but of course, fast forward many years, I realized half the things I was eating were probably, you know, not helping um, what was going on in the background. And it was during my twenties, I kind of struggled on. I was given a lot of, a lot of different diagnoses, like, like, you know, IBS and sinusitis and, they were talking about my joints. I was a runner. I was a like a professional that, that didn't get paid for. I was a sprinter. So I was very fit and very healthy. And I kind of, I think that masked my, what was actually going on in the background. I was, I was, you know, healthy relatively, even though I had a lot going on. Um, and it was really kind of towards the end of my twenties, there was so much stress. Now, of course, we all know the impact of stress on our gut and our microbiome and our nervous system. But um, it was actually the year I had my daughter, which was a wonderful year, by having her, but I had been working as a telecoms engineer in a very, very, very busy um, international company. And we were all literally like the company was sold. We were all out of work. Um, we were ma- made redundant, which is such an awful word because like, you're not redundant. There's other stuff you can do. But there was a, a sequence of events in my life when we think about our functional medicine timeline um, that all happened in a very short period of time. And it was almost like those background imbalances I had started to really wear their ugly heads I had my daughter Abby who's now 15 and a half and I kind of started to lose weight and normally after a baby you'd be going oh this is amazing but it was became a little bit sinister and it wasn't effortful um and I started getting chronic pains and it was really a very slippery slide that year I got married that year I lost my dog who was like the light of my life um I don't I know bereavements and stress and we talk about our client with this with our clients so I genuinely think all the losses all the life big life things that all happened in a really concentrated period of time triggered something um and then I got married in Italy and I ate my body weight in gluten (laughs) I ate my way around Italy literally and I don't what I'm not saying is gluten caused me to have Crohn's but it probably didn't help in a 
quite a permeable situation in the background, I would imagine. Mm. And the next few months became a bit of a blur. It was like literally the night of my wedding. The pains I got were unbearable. And it was almost like my body held it together just until just to get me through the wedding. Um, and unfortunately, it was very quick after that. I became so thin. I was in doubled over with pain. And the, the sadness was I actually ended up spending a lot of my, I just I used to sleep in my bathroom with the baby upstairs and my husband didn't know what to do with me mm -hmm. so I was just on the moving from the couch to the bathroom the couch to the bathroom and, and I'll talk a little bit about Crohn's in more detail because again I don't know exactly who's on and what kind of experience they have with these conditions but um it's it's so debilitating and it's painful and you literally can't keep any food in your body um and it pretty much escalated after a few months Charlotte I was given loads of different diagnoses at this point they still didn't know I had Crohn's um I was looking things up and I was told I had a urinary tract infection. Um, there was, I was, it's a hard diagnosis to get. The biggest challenge I think in IBD is lots of people are misdiagnosed. Some people sadly get missed in their diagnosis and end up not making it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I jest a lot, but the seriousness that actually runs behind this is pretty epic. So in 2008, early 2009, I ended up rushing myself into hospital um, where I couldn't bear it anymore. Um, I described the pain as like my barbed wire baby. It was just constant, at least when you give birth, if there's a beginning and an end to the pain, um, but not with Crohn's. And I ended up having emergency surgery. Um, when they opened me up, it was not a pretty sight. Um, they had to evacuate the whole floor that I was on because when they opened me up, my, my surgeon was an amazing man, lucky. I, like I still look back and feel very lucky that he happened to be in the hospital. He'd just come back from America. Um, doing revolutionary cool keyhole surgery and he literally said to me you were dying on the inside your insides were dead I was like gangrened I had fistulas I had holes in my inside so I was I still think that close to sepsis um alas as my grandmother always said you can't kill a bad thing so I made it through <laughs> what was meant to be one hour surgery ended up being around four and a half five hours um full abdominal surgery not keyhole he had to throw away his keyhole knives and literally um, open me up like a chicken. So sorry for the faint hearted. This is, it is a bit gory. Um, but when I made it through the other side um, and I looked down literally at my, you know, toast and my milky cornflakes, I was like, I was asking my team around me, going, what can I eat? There must be something I can do. And really the answer was not really no. I mean, you just have to kind of take your steroids and um, go on really extreme immunosuppression medication you might become infertile now and you mightn't have any more babies um, and you're probably so bad you're going to be back for more surgery within at least a year and that was kind of the prescription for my end you know my end it was kind of being projected and planned and this was how it was going to work and I literally had you know it's all for it's I mean it sounds so cliche but I had a eureka moment I was there like how am I going to get better something there has to be something in my control so it was literally as corny as it sounds sitting on a hospital bed googling Crohn's um, that I came across a book that literally changed my life and I had my light bulb and the rest is a little bit of you know the rest is a little bit history but it was the end was very fast and I remember waking up just going oh have I a bag and I escaped I escaped having a bag now colostomies are amazing um but I I was um I was in very very good hands so like that was where I ended up I ended up being in there for almost six weeks I was skin and bone and I was on you know elemental formulas I couldn't eat um and drinking water was even you know a big goal that we had so the recovery after surgery was pretty harrowing how long I, uh, go again say Sorry, how long were you in hospital I was there for six weeks okay wow um and my little baby like she was only she was only over a year old and like so they used to bring her in and I used to like wave and but you know what I found like what I suppose you know the way as a practitioner you end up you end up it's this balance of empathy and sympathy isn't it you're like I feel like so much of the time I know how my clients are feeling because I've kind of been there in everyone's situation is very different but I remember just you know when you come out the other end like the, the doom and the and the fact that there's really nothing that you can do to change things is very disempowering you know Mm. Um, and it was harrowing, but what I found and why I really understand the whole institutionalization side of this is at week five, they kind of said, you know, you're doing really well. You're walking around. You could go home. I was so afraid to go home. I was afraid because I was like, but I have all these people minding me. 
it happens so quickly, so quickly. And they literally went, get out of here. <laughs> We're not minding you anymore. They shoved me out the door. Like I never had that experience in my life because I'm pretty like resourceful and, um, you know, self-sufficient. But it was, um, yeah, it was a real, it was a real, a real eye opener into the environment we find ourselves in when we're sick amazing life-changing life-saving but the longer you stay there the slower your healing kind of becomes I think mm. um, so yeah I got I got booted out but it was it was good it was good for me um so that was like that was my you know kind of first step in this and as time went on I was reading I read you know the breaking the vicious cycle book on the specific carbohydrate diet and that literally was what I did now that's not saying everyone who has what I have should go and put their clients on the SCD diet but it was remarkably um it's really helpful for me in that moment um I don't stick to that diet now by the way mm. and we're going to probably touch on that like what I did then was needed for when I was there and not as time went on so yeah. um yeah that's a the short version <laughs> no it's amazing it's an amazing story and how I mean how did you cope when you left hospital well the first few weeks like like the first few weeks when I came out were I remember because of my scar like runs from here all the way down it was it's a huge scar um and I remember lifting my little girl it was really hard and I remember thinking how am I going to like do this because my husband has to go back to work and um it was just me and my little girl um and it was I was afraid of food like I was afraid to eat anything because anything I ate had the potential to have me in pain um so I ended up for a good few weeks living on elemental formulas now flip forward many years the science behind elemental formulas is amazing like the kind of the, the rubbishy stuff I was having now full of dairy and full of wheat and sugar kept me alive but wasn't really helping aid my healing probably you know potentially some um when I started to eat real food again and the STD was kind of what I did my mum was amazing because she would you know make a lot of crackers to me but I I was once interviewed and I said I baked my way out of Crohn's because I love cake and ground almonds became now omega-6 and all that but my ground almonds became my savior so I didn't go on to like a low residue diet when I was sick I had been told to eat a low residue diet and it really didn't do anything for me mm. all of the run-up to surgery nothing I did really helped but of course looking back I didn't do the things that we now know that may help um so what I found was um under the care of all the people around me I did a lot of acupuncture which I found really good um, and I was very lucky to have a sister-in-law who was a naturopath and she had me on butyrate, on phosphatidylcholine. I'd been on that through my pregnancy, luckily, even though I didn't know what I was taking because I was yeah. an engineer, right? I had no clue about choline. Now I'm totally obsessed with it. Um, and I, I was luckily, I was actually supplementing, even though I didn't really know a lot about what I was doing and glutamine. So I was being helped and really helped my recovery by being surrounded by people who kind of you know, pointed me in the right direction. And one of the most monumental days, you know, the way you have these very specific memories, but I remember going to my local, like the next town over to the health shop because we didn't have one where I live and pushing my, my little scrawny body, pushing my baby in in the buggy. And I was met by these gorgeous um, girls that worked in a health shop. And we just got chatting and I was like, hey, I just got found out I had Crohn's. I've just had surgery. I don't know what to eat. I've read about this cacao stuff. Like, really? Like, I knew nothing, nothing. Um, and they just pointed me to all the, you know, the, the, the really cool phytochemical rich nutrient dense foods. Um, and they gave me loads of recipes. And I remember thinking, oh, this is great. Um, and I just cooked and I baked and I had time to do it which is again, you know, the challenge of um, what we have, what I have is busyness and stress are not our friend and we need time to cook ourselves well, if that makes sense. So yeah. I was really, I was lucky I had a bit of time at the time, but but at, at, at six weeks post-surgery, I jumped on a plane and I went to visit my sister in Dubai. That was my goal because I knew the sun would help me heal. Mm. Um, and I think it did, like, I think it really helped. Um, the fear of traveling on an airplane was rather... Um, you know, it was pretty, pretty intense, but, but I was okay. Um, and that, that was it for me. I just kept getting better. Mm. And luckily 
um, not that I'm out to prove people wrong or right, um, my surgeon hasn't seen me since. And that was, I'm every year, the, the, you know, every year the, the, the chip on my shoulder gets lighter to the point it's almost like a pebble now. Mm. Um, and it just, I never went back. I actually never went back. Um, so, this, I mean, this is quite a personal question, but yeah, go I mean, for it. I'm all for it. In terms of your, your gut, yeah. Um, we, you know, we, we always associate IBD with whatever's go, <clears throat> going on in the gut, but did your condition affect? You know any other parts of your body you know any any that really yeah. you know things that perhaps have carried on even though you've really managed to support yeah. your gut well any of the issues yeah absolutely so before i got sick i had chronic eczema on this hand it's totally gone and it's my radar now for when i'm teetering towards inflammation again my mm. eyes i always had a problem with my eyes i had uveitis mm. And I never knew because, of course, we do. I was on eye drops. I always just thought I was like had itchy eyes. But now I know the gut skin axis, the gut eye, the gut like the gut lung, my skin. Um, and I suppose I would have always been a very mm, how do I describe it? They def when you go through surgery, yeah, your body has a memory of what was there physically in you before. But I definitely feel I was never afraid of anything, you know. I was pretty like robust, jump out of a plane, loved mm. a bit of adrenaline, but it definitely gave me a bit of a shake, you know, as to, oh, I need to, oh, I need to kind of slow down and I need to mind myself a bit. So I definitely feel like it changed me in my brain also. Like I'm not who I used to be. I definitely feel different. Mm. No, it's mostly good, but I definitely would have been a bit more, hmm, uh, I don't want to use the word anxious, but a bit more, hmm, we know our brains are directly affected by inflammation, right? So I would definitely find I worry more than I would have before this big life-changing event, you know? Mm. Um, but, 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 but back to your question, the biggest things for me, when I know I'm doing really well, is my skin. And I often will have my clients just look out for other seemingly disparate, dis disconnected sy systems in the body um, to see if they're, you know, involved. And uveitis, and now I actually see so many clients with uveitis really? also have ankylosing spondylitis, and they haven't really joined the two, if that makes sense. So there's a huge, you can just go through life with, you know, and, and if you have, let's say, even ankylosing spondylitis, who I see a huge amount of clients with, which is not something to... Like it's frightening how the, the trajectory of um, the development of autoimmunity is, is high. It's going to only get worse, I feel. But um, who would also then go on and end up with a diagnosis of Crohn's or colitis. Um, but for me, that was my thing. So other than that, I was kind of, you know, totally normal. <laughs> so mm. OK, well, let, let, let's, um, I suppose, get, get a bit more technical, um, although we could quite happily chat. <laughs> yeah i know i know you can read the story in the, in the um so you're, you're the ibd poster girl aren't you in ireland um so i suppose um in, in terms of people who um, listen to our webinars there's a great spectrum from you know brand new students to very well um, established practitioners but could you just give us an overview um about what we actually mean by ibd and perhaps some of the the conditions that we might associate with that i know that's a massive question but just a, a yeah a good so i suppose helpful. yeah no and it's a, you know what it's a really good question because i even know myself when i was you know studying this in college after being sick it was like oh and i remember reading so much about it but it's very very complex but when you boil it down to kind of its hallmark and um, kind of tags it's inflammatory bowel disease it's a chronic autoimmune inflammatory disease of the digestive system it includes Crohn's it includes colitis so ulcerative colitis now Crohn's is pretty standalone colitis its sister very very different manifestation has many many subgroups of um which I'm seeing more of so um conditions like the eosinophilic colitis indeterminate colitis microscopic colitis where they go and have an, um, a, a, you know, a, a sigmoidoscopy and the tissue looks fine to the naked eye. It's only on biopsy they find um, 
you know, um, microscopic inflammation. And there's also um, coll collagenous colitis. So there's a lot of different subgroups of ulcerative colitis now beginning, beginning to become far more um, known about, but they're still quite rare. They're, they're rare, I see them, they're not that rare. Mm. Symptom-wise, um, and in Crohn's, I suppose, just to touch on it, there is fistulizing Crohn's is a subgroup of the total Crohn's. That's what I had. It's the worst one. Mm. It's the most aggressive. It's the most life-threatening. And it's the one where you literally have fistulas and holes where your, your gastrointestinal system is trying to find a way through for the food but due to thickening, strictures, narrowing. Um, technology has moved on a lot. Balloon, balloon, um, uh, balloon endoscopies are being used to kind of stretch the bowel now. But anyway, um, symptom wise, there can be a lot of commonality across the two diarrhea, really chronic abdominal pain. Bloody stools are more common in colitis, depending on the location of the inflammation. In colitis, let's say you could have perianal or proctitis. Um, where it's very low down in the colon, in the anal area, so perianal inflammation. The difference as well between like two hallmarks of colitis and Crohn's is in Crohn's, um, it, the, the, the inflammation goes all the way through the bowel lining, so the colonic mucosa and the silk mucosa, and it's like the full thickness of the bowel in colitis. It's continuous, so there can be skips of inflammation in the gut. So for some, for example, I would see a lot of people with Crohn's who have mouth ulcers and, and that's where they're affected. Some people have it in their stomach and they have it nowhere else. So the real hallmark is skip lesions of different areas of the gastrointestinal system that have ulceration and inflammation and it goes through the thickness of the mucosa. Uh, colitis is a bit more, I, I don't want to say superficial because it's not superficial, but it's just the mucosa and the submucosa. Crohn's mm. goes all the way through. Stricture is not that common in colitis, although there are bound to be people who have a bit of a vague diagnosis because some people are like, yeah, I was told I have Crohn's, but I have this. And I'm like, crikey, you seem like you have a bit of both. And there's the diagnosis side of things. Obviously, we don't get into that is quite mm. dubious, you know. Um, now, so that's the kind of the standard. But just to point as well, and I remember saying this years ago at a talk I gave is that I have clients who their only symptom is constipation. So it's a bit like celiac, Charlotte. You remember when it was like celiac sprue and everyone like failure to thrive and thin and diarrhea. But we now know, of course, that the um, kind of more systemic symptoms aren't always what was documented when this disease was first found. Um, so that's kind of it at a really high level. We know that um, the, like the, the kind of the, the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system are both involved in its kind of pathogenesis or the development of it. Um, we used to think it was just TH1 and TH2 mediated, but now for anyone who's, you know, um, done a little, ex, you know, a little bit of an extra deep dive into immunology, which I really love, um, we know there's so many more subtypes now, um, like TH17 and Treg cells. We don't get that information really, unfortunately, a lot in the blood that our clients bring, but we know that there's a lot more going on in the gut, mucosal and more systemic immune system. And the question often, I think about, you know, and I ask my clients and my, my not my clients, but maybe my uh, students to think about is, is the development of an autoimmune condition a perfectly rational response to the presence of something shouldn't be there? Or is it your immune system gone wild and a non-normal response to your own commensal bacteria? No one has actually fully answered that question yet, but it could be a bit of both. Um, this is like there isn't an absolute answer for this, but I think about the immunosuppression medication families that are really just the only treatment there is, other than corticosteroid use, um, is that when we're shutting down an aberrant immune response, a really angry immune response, why is it firing up in the first place? And I suppose if this is where food comes in, and we'll hope maybe talk about that in a minute, but we're switching off something that is doing physical tissue damage, but as practitioners, we end up going way away from that diagnosis and going, hmm, when did it happen? And what triggered the inflammation? And, and we know now, of course, that like just in general, the factors, there is genetic susceptibility is, has to be there for any, well, especially with IBD, but most autoimmune conditions. There is the microbiome and its role at regulating our immune response and the early years that we have. I know for me, um, my early years was antibiotics, 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 antibiotics. And we know 
lack of diversity has a big role to play in, you know, atopy, allergy, where I began my life and then I switched over. So now when I meet people and I'm like, hmm, allergies, I guess I'm asthma, there's the potential there for chronic activation. And is there a risk then of an inability to switch off when it's pushed too far? So that's our whole like, you know, straw that breaks the camel's back. Yeah. Um, so I know like I could, I literally could go on. I don't know how much detail you want me to go into. I could <laughs> I think, talk about yeah. TH, 17 <laughs> cells. But. I, mean, I think if, if people want to follow that up and I think we we're friends with the guys over at Pure. So um, we'll, we'll just give them a, a little bit of a nod here. They did a, a talk the other night on gut immunology with the magnificent Ben Brown and Samuel Yannick. Oh, lovely, um, yes. So that was, I can't remember what night it was, but I had a, a small boy yep. being unwell, so I didn't get to listen to it, but they did a really good um, session. Brilliant. So that might be worth Brilliant. looking yeah. at, really just as a, a follow-up to what we're talking about here, because I think in terms of the fit test, where... Yeah. We're just one tool to support you. And I think the great thing about the fit test now is that we now include zonulin, which has always been used as a marker of intestinal permeability. Um, that's included as standard now on the fit 132 and 176, which I mentioned earlier. So previously that would cost you, you know, an additional 75 pounds to have that as part of the test. So that's now included, which is amazing. It's amazing. Um, and Again, um, when we send you the recording for today, um, you'll get a link to our YouTube channel. And there is a session on there by Dr. Brent Dorville, specifically on zonulin. So if you want to geek out on that, that's the place to go. Um, but I think that ties in quite nicely with really talking about IBD. And I know that zonulin is just one, one tiny aspect. I know. It's about looking at zonulin alongside the food sensitivities, the IgG reaction, the complement. You know, it's it's really you know cast in your net as wide as possible. Um, we are um, hopefully expen extending the panel yeah. again, um, but I'm Ooh, not wow. going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you anything about it because you don't have to. Tell me. <laughs> and I think legally, I'm not allowed to say anything. Um, <laughs> No, I think I'm, I'm just bigging it up. I, I can, but mm -hmm. um, the truth is, I don't really know exactly um, what it is yet. But it will be hopefully coming soon. Um, but there's more information in relation to intestinal permeability. So Ooh. I'm rambling on a bit. I'm very conscious of that. So, Karen, how do you? I suppose how do you approach IBD cases with functional testing? Because you know we are a functional testing company, and that's yeah. I suppose what we're all about. So just to try and bring it back to yeah. Absolutely. Yes. It's um, really important because I and I told you you need to roll me in, reel me in, Charlotte, because I could like talk, talk, talk. <laughs> um, so I um so when I think of IBD in general, we, you know, we know that so that's absolutely on point. Intestinal permeability in the science and is there, you know, Leo Gallon 25 years ago was talking about leaky gut as mm. a you know pre a predisposing factor to to the development of IBD and in first degree relatives, we know that increased intestinal permeability is a risk factor. So imagine the power that as a practitioner, power, I don't mean power, but the benefits for practitioners that are working with families of people with IBD um, that could assess food reactivity and zonulin and think of risk assessment with regard to, you can't you know, predict the future, but you know, I'm not the hugest fan of stool-based zonulin but I am more of a fan of um the blood-based zonulin mm -hmm. um so we know intestinal permeability precedes the development of IBD and even though we can't go back to the past when we think about upregulation of zonulin will require us if we know it's really upregulated to do a lot more just direct intestinal repair work alongside those dietary changes that we want to know to narrow the field of focus um, of where are these fires being lit in our clients with an already existing inflammatory disease. Unfortunately, like we don't really get to see people before their diagnosis. People are rolling into our clinics already with you know, an actual chronic disease. So when I look at my clients who are already on such restricted diets, sometimes when I meet them, the challenge and balancing act becomes, and this is where FIT can be a very, very useful tool, is that what you want is to only restrict what you need to restrict and not overzealously take away whole food groups, take away healthy foods that the patient may actually not have a problem with. 
And the challenge we have, I suppose, as practitioners without these tools, and I was actually never in the past a fan of straightforward IgG testing. I actually never, ever did it, Charlotte, before the KBMO test, even prior to you, your, your direct involvement with them, mm. because I wasn't convinced um, that the, the presence of the C3G, you know, the two signals for the kind of price of one really, really gives it an increased um, level of confidence because as I said, right, so our clients are potentially on already restricted diets. We don't want to perpetuate that. Um, and I'm not a long term a fan of long term unnecessary elimination, to be honest at all, because mm. our microbiome will be famished of fiber and nutrients. And, you know, using the fish, it actually it's like laser precision versus blanket bombing, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, and our job, like at the end of the day, because of the role of stress in all autoimmune conditions, not just IBD, our job is to not add to their stress. Our job is to go, okay, let's assess, let's only remove what we want to remove and see where the inflammatory response is being generated. And with the intestinal permeability, I use it alongside stool testing a lot, actually, because mm. I find the two together very, very useful. Because if we're looking at, let's say, um, someone with IBD, barrier integrity is going to be, you know, under massive pressure. Um, anxiety and stress will also be really, really high. And our clients are so malnourished that it's a really delicate position to be in. And we think we have a big responsibility to not have them become fearful of food because having been there, I was petrified. And sadly, and I'm sure you'll have had this experience too, I've worked with clients who've come through nutrition um, afraid of everything because somebody said, you can't eat anything. Here's your list of 40 foods to avoid on a standard IgG test. That's very unhelpful. And it's, if anything, it's a bit dangerous. So I'm not a fan of that. And that's where the fit can be very useful because it's you're not getting these epically long, un, you know what I mean? Like unwieldy length, long list of foods. It's just those that are directly activating the confidence system. Um, and I think that then reduces our client stress massively because we're only down to the things that matter. If, I hope that makes a bit of sense. No, absolutely. I mean, I... I had a client recently who came to me with an IgG test from another laboratory. Won't, mm -hmm. uh, won't do any naming and shaming, or I will. Yeah. Um, but she had 54 foods on her list and she was following a FODMAP diet. Oh my. Plus, plus the foods that she had on her IgG test, which was absolutely madness. I mean, really you know if I think about the conversations that we had it was less about her physical symptoms and more about the stress that she was under Huge. Um, so she was on low FODMAP avoiding all these foods and she was taking loads of antimicrobials she was on probiotic like rocket fuel um, and really really in, in, in a bit of a mess um, she's a student as well, a, a nutritional therapy student, and a creator. Like that's hard. Just, that's so hard. Yeah, it's just too much. So yeah. um, at the moment, so she's just trying to, I suppose, chill out around her diet. Obviously, not wanting to to trigger any symptoms too badly. Um, and then we're going to look at the fit test. Um, but then I think a lot of it is that she's convinced that she's got food sensitivities and there must be a problem and it's got to find out what it is I know and Charlotte like that's why I feel like you know we're not just helping people we're it's a it's a hugely responsible role we find ourselves in with mm. people who are vulnerable people who are sick um and we don't want to and even look you take a you know a, a, an omega test or a, a if just a, an FBC like or a CBC imagine putting someone on a low FODMAP diet for a potential good reason and then looking at they've no folate, no B12, they're already macronutrient, micronutrient depleted, and this is going to deplete them even more. We have a responsibility. And that's why I have never been a fan of these other IgG tests. Mm. So I'm actually, to be honest, like mad as this might sound, the fact that I'm actually confident and I'm talking about this stuff, I don't mean confident, but I have faith in this because I never had faith in these tests before mm. this so and I'm not just saying this I am like I am I, I am a stick to my guns person 
it's a bit like I rant about carrageen and I'm like, don't talk to me about supplements until you get your carrageen in it. Then we can talk. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, and I don't mean to be facetious now or anything like that, but I'm very, I am literally just like, no. So I, you, so you exactly that conversation you just had with a client. I see this day in and day out. So this stress is like an anti-stress test. And I, so for anyone who's listening, who might be curious about the test, it's a brilliant way to pre-screen your clients before you go down the road of overzealous with re- removal of food mm. as a pre-screening tool. It's wonderful because it narrows that field. But also um, it's a great way for maybe people who are already doing work themselves or are doing, let's say, a three, 12 week low fab map to actually go, oh, OK, it's just these foods I'm having an inflammatory reaction to. A lot, with the microbiome side of things, just to kind of even just kind of finish that th- train of thought when I'm looking at, um, so like, how am I using it with other functional tests? Let's say microbiome assessments, there's plenty on the market. I won't name any tests or names or companies of whose tests I use, but two very specific markers I really zoom in on are fecal elastase and secretory IgA. And I find them very helpful because if you think about, uh, if you step back from autoimmune inflammatory cascade and the inflammatory reaction and the cytokine storm, um, what we don't want in a barrier impaired autoimmune client is to be putting them on a diet, but they can't digest and absorb those foods. So they've lost their oral tolerance. And our job is alongside not having them eat inflammatory foods and helping them find the foods that are not provoking it's at the same time as actually assessing, well, if they have very low secretory IgA, they're going to be very, very sensitive to a lot of foods, just viscerally. Um, but also, can they digest and absorb the foods that we want them to be eating? So it's really useful because um, if we, obviously if we lose enzyme function, low stomach acid, um, low fecal elastase, brush border enzymes, their general digestion and absorption will be impaired. So it's very useful to assess where are they at? Are, are they a candidate for, for enzyme therapy alongside a kind of a really, really well controlled food elimination reintroduction diet? Mm-hmm. Um, and when we think about like re- reestablishing oral tolerance or central tolerance, um, the, the fat soluble vitamins. So if they're like not making lipase, how are they going to digest that fish oil you so want them to have? without lipase support so just little something to think about like for the experienced practitioners this will be like yeah yeah whatever but Mm -hmm. for someone new and then second to that so the elastase and secretory iga because if you have somebody who's really high secretory iga their immune system is already on fire and they're over and zealously reacting and we think about the role of iga is to coat and present, you know, and you know the APC cells and the dendritic cells to say, hey, this is John. He's with me. Don't react. When that's low, there'll be a complete, you know, kind of chaos in there. Yeah. And just one other thing on that, um, you know, I don't get overly obsessed with the specific strains in a stool test. But one example, um, let's say acromantia, the new kid on the block, everyone's obsessed with. Um, that's the barrier, you know, the mucin barrier regulator. So if that's low then that's something that's very important because that barrier integrity is going to need real special attention and use and building up. So the, the fit test along with that can be really helpful. Um, just I find in our very sensitive clients because they're all really sensitive. Um, does that kind of, you know? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, it's a really good point. I think what you said about, you know, this is old news to more experienced practitioners. I think it's good to hear because, mm. I mean, I, I used to work from the laboratory um, as, as you know, and yeah. a lot of clients or a lot of practitioners would order, you know, 2000 plus um, on tests for a new client, which is great because these tests are brilliant and the labs that supply them are brilliant. But what does that tell you? You know, that, that's, that isn't any kind of screen or isn't kind of any way to, yeah. to work with your client because every step that you take with your client, you're going to change something else. And then that's going to change something. And you're going to have this sort of step, step in stone yeah. sort of approach. So I think it's, it's dangerous. So you said, you know, we have it got is. responsibility. We do. Um, we do. And, and very often, even just doing a Fit 22. Mm. You know, I've done. Like, I've done a lot. Yeah, just yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, just as a, a first step. And you might, I mean, I think now that Zonulant's included, it's... Yeah it's a no-brainer probably to do no, I know yeah I mean I you know I, I remember I did, when I lasted my um 
fit test you know a few weeks later Zonulin came out I was like oh god ah, I know. <laughs> um, but I've got, I have got some good questions from Amanda um what is the what is recommended to raise circuitry IGA this is oh, yeah. seen as very low with a foot two issue yes foot two. and she's also asked about um have you ever seen bile acid in the thousands so it's two questions so if you sort of the the yeah yeah, yeah 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 so with secretory IgA, and I know there's this, this kind of potential genetic um, potential behind very, very chronically low levels as well. But like, so I think yeast is a really important one to think about because we think about yeast in the gut overproduction or overpress, so lots of yeast. And I, Charlotte, is the 132 or the 176 that has the yeast? The 13? I think they both do. They both do, don't they? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, but in inflammatory bowel disease, just very, very quickly, there's a very strong, so anti-saccharomyces through VCA antibody um, um, link in our inability in inflammatory bowel disease to regulate yeast growth in the gut. Okay, so that's just one little nugget to keep in the back. What yeast does is it secretes protease degrading enzymes and secretory IgA will be degraded by the high presence of high levels of yeast in the gut. So there's yeah. this kind of yin and yang between those two. Yeah obviously low IgA will drive you to be more vulnerable to high yeast infiltration and because it's an opportunist. So in order, so that would be one thing to go, is it in there? Um, have you done again of the urinary microbial organic acids? Is there a lot of, you know, tartaric acid or arabinose coming out in the urine? Yeast doesn't always show up in a stool test, I find. Tricky one. So you don't find it. It's like, that doesn't mean it isn't in there. But yeah. so, so there's that yeast component as a direct effect on it. Stress, massive you can't have decent iga if you're chronically stressed so don't forget about that one but from a nutrient perspective um i would you I, I really am a fan of saccharomyces boulardii it's my desert island probiotic okay. um more than any of the others so that can be very very useful it's antifungal in a really gentle way um supports immune secretory iga improvements over time um essential fatty acids if tolerated so i'm a yeah. bigger fan of phospholipid forms or some really good companies out there would add additional ex extra lipase into their combination so that's really good don't forget about polyphenols though if you're supplementing fish oil in a very inflamed person lipid peroxidation and all of that so always think about you know quenching the flames with polyphenols i find polyphenols really supportive mm -hmm. as well some gorgeous blends on the market um think is very important, but vitamin A is often forgot about. Big, it's huge. And you think about the yeah. T cell function. So vitamin A. Um, that's kind of my general goal. Vitamin D, usually. D and D, yeah. But I am like with vitamin D, I test pretty much all my clients because of that link between, you know, autoimmunity and vitamin D. No deficiency precedes flares generally, but treating with D doesn't directly get rid of the condition. But yeah, a, I'm a big a, I'm a big fan of like A, D, E, and K together. I don't like mono supplementing anything to be honest. Um, so absolutely, Charlotte. Yeah, but I, think, I mean, I think when you see um, any kind of issue with screech IGA, um, you know, when I used to look at stool tests, hundreds of stool tests. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, it was, you know, the, the one thing that always used to flag up was, well, food sensitivities. You know, yes, yeah. more so when they're high, but I think also when you're seeing them low as well, you know, what, what's getting in the way, what's causing the, you know, the interference, I suppose. Yeah. And, the, and the ability of the body. So as well, if you have low IgA, you're, the, the, you know, the, the, the kind of the covering of that IgA coating of those food, I know, antigens coming in is going to be way down under par so there's heightened increased likelihood of more food sensitivities as you said um, and the other thing on that as well just one other thing you might find like anybody working with people with IBD that you know the, the GAPS diet the autoimmune paleo protocol the specific carbohydrate diets they're very sulfur rich they're heavy on the red meat and in colitis there is a subset of people who have a real struggle with sulfur in the gut because of their dysbiotic guts and because of hydrogen sulfide production potentially mm -hmm. um so there's a you know the way there's these nuances so if i'm looking like as i said i'm obsessed with choline i don't want i don't want anyone giving up eggs unless they really need to because i'm obsessed like the yolk is so important but if you have an issue with the egg white 
you want to know about that before you know baking your way out of Crohn's like me <laughs> brilliant for that because these cookie cutter dietary approaches are phenomenally useful but if you combine that with the fish you're getting a personalized version of that almost aren't you yeah 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 absolutely. anyway yeah so um I, I don't know why I can't see the questions but shout away Charlotte like yeah, the other one was um have you seen um you know many stool tests with um bile acids up in the thousands yes mm, not a massive amount and I think of bile acid metabolism as a direct consequence of whatever's going on microbially in there um so bile acid conjugation and most of you know like I said a strong link with a lot of autoimmune conditions but I haven't I've often seen um like you'd expect higher bile acids in um or deconjugated bile acids in inflammatory bowel disease it's a consequence of the condition like it's not an abnormal I wouldn't say it's abnormal because of what's happening we know that our beneficial microbes are involved in regulation of those bile acids and secondary bile acids in the gut so I'll often, it's hard, I suppose, in isolation, I have seen it high, but there's generally a kind of an understandable reason why it is high. Mm. Um, and then the question becomes, what do you do next? Certain probiotic strains have potential benefit of prebiotics. Again, very, very useful. And um, bile flow, um, choline, ben, you know, there's so much, I suppose. So it's, I don't know if there's any a direct answer to that. I have seen it to be high, um, but sometimes understandably so. Yeah, I think I think that it it really depends on what else is going on. I think with the exactly, stool test, yeah. it's yeah. I think it's it's difficult or it's dangerous if you start focusing on one, one marker. marker. And I think yeah. your your example, um, Karen, talking about yeasts is perfect yeah. because you know you might not see any cultured yeast, you might not see any yeast detected by PCR. And I think PCR is really rubbish for looking for yeast. Sorry. Yeah. The, no, that. I agree. It's, um, not, it's not the best, Charlotte. No, I agree completely. And, and I think, you know, you might see, you know, th that yeast not being there, you know, microscopically, it might not be there either. But you might see secretia IJ on the floor and some other markers that would go, OK, well, if we join this up with the symptoms that we're seeing. Exactly. Is, is yeast a problem? Do we need to think about looking for yeast in a different way? Exactly, yeah, exactly. And you only find what you look for, don't you, in testing? Yeah, and yeah. I think, you know, for anyone who's like, you know, we're, you and me are doing this like a long, long enough time, you start to become like, you know, anyone who's new, who's just qualified, is like, oh my God, this is so much, but you become mm -hmm. more skilled in pattern recognition over time, you know, you do. Mm. Um, and there's loads of really amazing workshops and talks. And actually, like I did um, two, two years ago, I did, there's on the peer encapsulation site, there's a lot of, I did ankylosing spondylitis. So there's a lot of really detailed information in there as well um, for other kind of chronic autoimmune conditions. Yeah, I think it, it, is, it is a difficult one. And I, and I, mean, I, I don't know about you, Karen, but I remember when I first started practicing, one of you know, the only tests that we really did were mm. adrenal stress tests. <laughs> and can you remember the spitting in a tube candidate spitting test? Spitting in a tube. <laughs> <laughs> everyone had candidate. Everyone was on an anti candidate diet. Uh, everyone was constipated. And everyone had bad blood sugar. I mean, that was, that was, was our, our trade at the time, <laughs> wasn't it? Um, it was, yeah. Amanda's just said, thank you so much. Fantastic health. Uh, help oh and you're help. very welcome Amanda. Think good results help. taking um aronia berry fruit to raise yes. um yes. Which I, I very much like that aronia berry fruit uh, and i love the fucoidin seaweed extract because mm. it is phenomenal for a Just lot of reasons. often often can't use polyphenols with histamine issues um is that someone is that you are you saying that or is that someone else saying that? So this is from um amanda just saying that she so she's used quite a lot of clients with um histamine issues yeah um and the polyphenols can be problematic yeah and i just think as well you think about your i i would think about why is that i wonder what's going on with the microbiome because our microbiome are the activators of those polyphenols mm. So I'm, and then you could look at like organic acids and look at the polyphenol activation. There's a lot of like, I'm such a fan of them. And I think they're worth kind of, I think if someone is that sensitive, they're probably having um, phenol sensitivity going on and need serious, like de, I suppose not desensitization, but I find that that's probably a symptom of a wider microbiome challenge going on because they're so good. I just, I love polyphenols, but yeah, yeah I have a client, histamine is a hard one. It's a tough one. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah I see. I see a lot, a lot of histamine issues in my practice because I specialise in menopause. Yes. So it's all crazy estrogen and crazy histamine and histamine. They're just you know, yeah. cheech and chong, aren't they? Yeah. Absolutely. So, <laughs> um, so I mean, I think we've we've looked at the functional testing. So think about stool testing. Um, you've mentioned um, fatty acid testing. Fit yeah, test. I'm a big fan of fatty acid testing. Yeah. Big fan. Um, any other any other go to tests that you use alongside fit? Alongside, I I'm a big fan of like a not an overzealous tester. Mm. The tests I I really like a really good blood draw. You know, I really do. I like um, urinary methylmalonate for B12. Yeah. yeah, I very much like the Dutch test, and now we're not going to talk about hormones today, but I think. If you're chronically stressed and your circadian biology is broken and your rhythms are off, your gut clocks are going to be off, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Or if your central, you know, suprachiasmatic nucleus is misfiring, the rest and the rhythms of everything are going to be off. So I really love, and you wouldn't really think about food sensitivity in the Dutch necessarily, but uh, I actually feel those two go together very well also because, um, you know, are you having challenges? producing cortisol what's your cortisol awakening response like are you able to are the rhythms of digestion up and running you know so and are, is the chronic is the chronic stress there because you think about food sensitivity and stress are so intertwined aren't they that mm -hmm. i very much like the dutch test um and it has a little nice if you don't want to do a full-blown you know urinary organic acids i very much um like the little panels at the back um they're my favorites really i do Stool will be up there. Finger prick, full omegas, vitamin D assessment, um, food reactions. Um, and that's pretty much it. I'm not a, that's kind of it for me. And I have to remember as well, in the UK, it's slightly different. But in Ireland, we've got massive transportation challenges with couriers, Brexit. Um, yeah, I have to yeah. be very judicious in the tests that I select and the ease of, and that's what I love about this test. No couriers, just into the envelope and off mm. the go. So it's not, there aren't any, um, what's the word? There's no issues blocking our use of it within this jurisdiction, you know? So it's brilliant, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. And now yeah. with Zonulin, it's like really gonna open up a whole other window because um, I remember sitting in a room years ago, listening to Fasano talking about Zonulin. And I was like, wow, this Zonulin thing sounds so amazing, but we can't get it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be game changing, Charlotte. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I, I, you did say about um, Zonulin not being, sort of stool Zonulin not being the best. And, that, mm -hmm. and um, I mean, I, I'd agree with you. I mean, I. Would you? Okay. Yeah. And again, I'm probably going to make myself quite unpopular um, if certain <laughs> people listen to this, but. Um, <laughs> I just, I just don't think um, it's worth it in stool. You know, I've I, seen I very, don't. very few positive zonulin results in stool. And I've seen a lot of stool tests and a lot of zonulin tests. Um, whereas I think it's much more clinically relevant as part of the fit test or, or blood, however, you know, you're, you're measuring it. Yeah. Um, because we're looking, particularly with fit, we're looking at the um, antigen, not the protein. Yeah. Not the protein and big, that big is, game changer, definitely. That is the key. And it's very important that that's a really good take home for people because it's like, it's, it's not that, it's not protein, which is where the controversy can be, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 But FIT um, was, I'm uh, sorry, did um, develop the Zonulin um, yeah. alongside Fasano as well. So it's um, really cool. Ah, oh, okay, yeah. That's great. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, we've got another question. So I'm just going to. Yeah look at that because we are rapidly run out of time how on earth did we get how did that happen <laughs> i don't know um yes so amanda is just saying she she totally agrees about stools on you then thank you amanda yay um you can you can join our club um <laughs> i think we'll, we'll probably have to come up with some kind of tenuous link to do something on food sensitivity and hormones and guts and and all of that i think I think that's the joy of food sensitivity testing. You can pretty much do a webinar on anything. <laughs> so yeah. we'll, have you, we'll have you back. <laughs> um, does anyone have any more questions before we head off? Because I am conscious it's a Friday and it's a Friday afternoon and the sun is shining where I am. So um, oh, it's glorious, glorious here. So I'm sure you're all desperate to get away. But if you do have any other questions, I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to get them typed in. Um, 
If not, please send any questions to me following the webinar and you will get a follow-up email probably tomorrow, um, just sending you over to the YouTube um, channel where I will make sure that's uploaded. In fact, I'm gonna upload it right now. So if you do go to YouTube, just search for KBMO Diagnostics UK and you can see all of our old interviews we have on there in sessions. So there's a couple with the mighty Brent um, Dorval, um, who goes into the more techie stuff. And we have um, a couple of interviews, uh, one with Caroline Sherlock on histamine and Fiona Morse on fertility, which is a really good one as well. So um, if you haven't seen those, please have a look. Um, and we'll see you next time. We have got two more coming up over the next few weeks. We have a session with Dr. Terry Long on um, perimenopause and skin and food sensitivity testing, which is really interesting. And Terry always has loads of amazing advice for us. Um, personally and also for our clients. Um, and we've also got uh, Gillian Bertram talking about integrated cancer care, which is really interesting. So we've got some good stuff coming up. So um, keep an eye on that. But if you ever miss anything or you miss the webinars or the registrations, um, they'll always be uploaded to the YouTube channel. So um, you'll have that link. So Karen, I don't think we have any more questions. I think we've, um, we've answered all those. Um, Thank you very much. Um, sorry, it's Amanda's just said it. There's no sun in Manchester. Sorry. Me neither, Amanda. Yeah, I we had sun for one day yesterday, which is why I'm a bit. I just realised, Charlotte, I'm a bit like rosy, rosy looking. <laughs> and I was just thinking how pale I look next to you. I mean, you, you know, it must must be the Irish in me. <laughs> <laughs> um, lovely. Well, thanks very much for joining us and um, thanks, hope to see you again soon. And thanks so much for your time, Karen. We've, we've oh, really you're very welcome. It. Pleasure as always. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.